Good evening, everyone. I'm Rachna Singh, MLA for Surrey Green Timbers. And I'm here on behalf of my legislative colleagues representing the Fraser Health region, from Burnaby to New Westminster, to Surrey, to White Rock, from Chilliwack to Hope, and all the communities in between. Joining me is my co-host and colleague, John Martin, MLA from Chilliwack. Also with us are special guests, Dr. Victoria Lee, President and CEO of Fraser Health, Fraser Health and Dr. Martin Lagua, Medical Health Officer of Fraser Health. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am here on the Coast Salish territories and also Stolo nations and recognize that you may be representing uh, from other territories as well. 15 minutes ago, we cheered on the people who have been working tirelessly to keep our province safe and ensure that British Columbians can continue to receive the essential goods and services we need. Our heartfelt thanks to healthcare workers, care aides, grocery store workers, truck drivers, and so much more, the essential workers for all that you do. We also want to thank, thank those, all of you who are watching this tonight for continuing to holding the line so that we can get through this together and flatten the curve. We recognize the sacrifices that British Columbians have made. This has been an extremely difficult time for all of us. It is unprecedented and we know people have questions. From the beginning, our government has been quick to provide people with the latest information on COVID-19. Our province was among the first to provide daily updates. We are pleased that the BC government and Health Minister Adrian Dix provided us the opportunity to continue all this information through the virtual town halls. It is one of many town halls this week to help keep British Columbians bring questions to the people who have been leading the COVID-19 efforts in each of our regions. As we get started, I'm going to hand over to my co-host, MLA John Martin, to give us a quick overview of what this town hall, town hall will look like. Thank you so much, MLA Singh. It's a, it's a pleasure. And, and thank you for everybody that's uh, taking the time to enjoy us this evening. This is uh, truly uh, a unique uh, uh, opportunity. You know, it's great to be here. And uh, you know, all of the MLAs from all of the parties, our health authority leadership, everyone is collaborating with all British Columbians to have this opportunity to to have their questions, their inquiries, their great unknowns be addressed by our public health experts and our health uh, healthcare leaders. And th thanks so much, everybody uh, uh, who uh, had a hand in putting this together. So it is uh, it's a great pleasure of mine to uh, introduce once again to uh, Dr. Victoria Lee, the uh, CEO of uh, Fraser Health, and Dr. Uh, Martin Lavoie, the medical health officer of Fraser Health. You'll be hearing uh, much more from them. Uh, uh, as the uh, evening uh, ensues, uh, and they'll be answering uh, all of your questions to the best they can. And uh, what I'd like to do is just ask both of our, uh, our guests to uh, maybe introduce ourselves and tell us a little bit about uh, what you actually do. And maybe I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much uh, to you, first of all, um, for hosting us this evening, and certainly my pleasure to uh, join you virtually on this town hall. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Victoria Lee. I'm the CEO President of Fraser Health Authority. Uh, the Fraser Health Authority, as mentioned earlier, covers 20 municipalities from Burnaby all the way to Hope, and uh, we serve 1.8 million uh, people across our region. And during these very, very challenging times, it's been my privilege to lead our organization of over 30,000 people that I think you have um, um, rightly called healthcare heroes during these very, very challenging times. I know every day, uh, each of the uh, people that are working, whether they're in front of front lines in our clinical acute care or behind the scenes in supportive roles, everybody's been going above and beyond uh, to deliver the necessary health services. And I want to acknowledge uh, 
those folks in our health system right now uh, that have been doing tremendous amount of work across. And uh, with that, I also want to acknowledge uh, leadership across the province, as well as our community partners. Every evening, I hear the sounds and cheers in our communities and support that you've provided to our healthcare workers and health system. And it's you know, it might not seem like a lot, but it means a lot when, and I've heard that from a lot of people that I encounter, whether again, they're working in our hospitals or behind the scenes, infection control or public health. So I again, like to start by thanking everyone and looking forward to this evening as well. Thank you. Dr. Labo. Yes, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Martin Lavoie. I'm the uh, Vice President, Population Health, and the Chief Medical Health Officer at Fraser Health. And I know we're going through very challenging times right now, and I understand that people have all sorts of questions. And I'm quite happy tonight to be here uh, to be able to uh, tr do my best to answer all these questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you to you both. Uh, and we look forward to, uh, to hearing more of you in the uh, uh, the uh, coming uh, uh, minutes uh, to come. Uh, so we've, we've asked uh, British Columbians uh, from all over to submit their questions on uh, COVID-19 in advance of this town hall. And uh, MLA Singh and I will take turns addressing uh, uh, this and reading out uh, the questions. And uh, whoever feels more appropriate to uh, address the uh, question, uh, just uh, feel free to go ahead. And uh, to, the, uh, to the people that are uh, tuning in here, uh, don't worry if you didn't get a chance to submit your questions in advance. If you're viewing this town hall from the government or uh, uh, the Government of BC Facebook page, uh, you can submit your questions in the comment uh, section down below and we'll be able to address them uh, later on this evening. So uh, please uh, think about uh, putting your questions together and submitting them uh, now. Uh, but please be, be aware that we, we receive an awful lot of uh, uh, questions uh, for a forum like this, and we'll uh, do our best to get uh, to uh, as many of them as possible. And if you don't get a chance to get an actual response to your question, please know that these will be addressed outside of the town hall uh, if you provided your email address uh, at the time of the uh, submission. Thank you so much for everyone tuning in. Uh, this is a great uh, opportunity for uh, everyone to come together in uh, British Columbia and become uh, much more informed. And uh, I guess we're gonna start off with the questions right now and I'm gonna turn this over to uh, my, uh, my colleague, uh, MLA Singh. Thank you so much, John. Uh, and uh, I will just echo what you have said. These have been very difficult times. And uh, I really would like to thank Dr. Lee and Dr. Lagua uh, for joining us today. And also all of you who have joined and I'll start with our first question. And, uh, and that is uh, something that we, uh, that's been on uh, all of our minds, including people living in the Fraser Health region. Uh, folks have question about our province's uh, COVID-19 testing strategy. People like Andreas from Surrey would like to know, will we be able to get a test now or in the future to find out if we have, if we, if we have had COVID-19? Yes. So that's a good question. So in BC, we've worked actually quite hard uh, to increase our capacity to test well beyond what we had initially when the pandemic started. And so we're hoping that um, now that the numbers are getting lower and lower, that we will be able to test anyone who actually wants to be tested, who has symptoms, obviously. We don't recommend testing for people without any symptoms, but people with symptoms uh, that could be related to COVID-19, so uh, respiratory symptoms, uh, we, uh, we are hopeful that we'll be able to offer the test to anyone who actually uh, needs it. And I can add to that uh, response that we have actually 11 sites across our region that uh, people can come and test and be assessed for COVID-19. They're available on our website, uh, as well as BCCDC Testing Center Finder. Uh, you can also do a self-assessment uh, through the tool that's available provincially through the website or uh, through an app. So that's a convenient way to see whether uh, you should get tested or not. And as uh, Dr. Love well mentioned, the testing has been expanded and we do have a capacity in our testing uh, and assessment centers to accommodate. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Christina in Mission and she asks, when someone has symptoms but does not meet the testing criteria, are there close contacts 
still contacted? Okay, that's a good question. So technically, we need to know of a particular case um, to be able to reach that case and then ask who the contacts may be. And so if we don't know that the person is actually infected with COVID-19, we would not be able to do that. Now, of course, the person being infected could do that on their own and they could tell people that, well, I've had symptoms, I didn't get tested, but if you get symptoms, maybe you should also do the, the self-isolation. So that's something that can be done. Everybody can participate in that. Now, hopefully, uh, as the numbers are getting lower and our capacity is, is also increased, if we're able to test anyone with symptoms that are relating to uh, COVID-19, then we would be able to contact that person who is positive and identify all the contacts. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the next question is from Tiffany. Uh, she's from Abbotsford and she would like to know how many active cases of COVID-19 uh, are there in the Fraser Health Authority? Yes, so the total that of uh, the number of cases we've identified so far in Fraser Health is 705. But over time, of course, people recover and then they go back to uh, their normal activities. And so at the moment, we have approximately 309 cases who are considered active, either because they're hospitalized or they just got diagnosed recently and they're still going through their symptoms. And uh, I'll also add to uh, Dr. Lavoie's response because I think he's too bashful to say anything about how hard uh, the work is behind the scenes to ensure that we're following up with all of these cases. So behind the number of cases, 705 that Dr. Lavoie mentioned, there's over 2,200 contacts that the population public health team has been followed up, uh, following up with, as well as uh, infection prevention control and workplace health. So I want to just take the opportunity to acknowledge those teams because there's an incredible amount of work done for each case to risk identify any contacts and then follow up with those contacts for daily monitoring for 14 days. And that there's been a lot of improvement in efficiency in how we do that, but it's still a significant Number. And again, I think sometimes those folks are not necessarily acknowledged, but really unsung heroes behind the scenes in uh, ensuring that we're uh, flattening the curve in BC. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And especially for that shout out, uh, Dr. Lee, that's, uh, that's great. So Terry of uh, Chilliwack, uh, right here in uh, good old Chilliwack, asked a question that uh, a lot of people are, are asking. Uh, why is it that we're not privy to the location the city of people who have tested positive? So that is an interesting question. So when the pandemic was declared, um, that meant that there, the virus was actually circulating. And so it came to BC and it started to circulate in our communities. So sharing the information, especially at the beginning when our numbers are quite low, uh, could create issues in terms of identifying people who have been um, tested positive and come from cases. And we know that sometimes this can be challenging as people can be um, identified and, and uh, negatively affected. And so in, in the beginning, we did not inform in terms of the location. And as the numbers grew, now it won't make any difference if we share the locations because now it circulates in all the communities. So we pick up cases here and there over time. And if one day it's gonna be in this community, the next day it'll be in another. And so it is circulating in all our communities. Uh, and, and so that's why at the moment we're not sharing the location. So you have to consider that COVID-19 is circulating in your community, wherever you are. And uh, that's why we, all the precautions, all the measures that we've put in place are actually uh, across the whole province and not just in certain locations. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And uh, of course, uh, we are hearing from Dr. Uh, Henry talking about how the curve is, uh, uh, has started to flatten, uh, which means that people are looking to the future and uh, what it may look like. And also Shelley uh, in Langley, she, uh, she would like to know, seeing at how BC is doing so well, flattening the curve, um, are we going to have to wait for the rest of the world before we can restart our economy? Yes, actually, we don't have to wait for the rest of the world. As we've seen, each country, each jurisdiction is seeing their outbreak at different times. And it's what happens in our jurisdiction uh, that is important. And so that's why it's, it's one thing to look, for example, at the whole country. And, but we can see that we have a different curve than uh, in, other jurisdictions, in other provinces and territories. And so what, when we make our decisions to start um, 
loosening up on our measures over time, slowly, uh, it will be based on our local, uh, provincial epidemiology. So the situation in BC, uh, how it's progressing, and, and this is what we will be looking at. Yeah, and I will also share some of the conversations that Dr. Lavoie and uh, our team have been having. What would that look like? And some of the considerations do include, you know, what is our health system capacity in terms of critical care, acute capacity? Uh, what about our vulnerable populations in terms of long-term care settings or other settings like uh, uh, street and trench population or correctional facilities that we're seeing? Uh, do we have the testing capacity? capacity to ensure do more of the testing if we're looking at uh, expanded uh uh, uh, expanding our uh, work elsewhere. So if we slowly uh, loosen up some of the uh, restrictions that are currently in place, and then uh, do we have the capability to ramp up quickly again if it does get worse? So I think there's a lot of considerations that we need to um, actually look at. And uh, there's a lot of active dialogue at the uh, regional, provincial, and national, international levels as well to ensure that we're doing this in a, a proactive, but also comprehensive in the right way so that we don't bounce back between um, having a lot of COVID-19 cases and the economic impacts, uh, but also uh, uh, not having uh, the cases with the restrictions that are currently in place. So it's a delicate, um, I think, consideration with all of those factors that we look at closely. So, and I would add, so in BC, uh, because I think behind that question is, are we there yet? When is this happening? And I think we're not quite there yet. We're starting to, to see the, re the reduction in numbers. And so flattening the curve means we need to get to very, very low numbers uh, before we can even start uh, considering releasing some of those measures. And so I think we have, we need a little bit more patience, un well, unfortunately, but at the same time, it's very important that we do that and that could, we all participate and continue with all the, the measures and that we adhere to those measures. And, and we continue to look at the situation and if all goes well in a number of weeks, and Dr. Henry has talked about May possibly, if all goes well, uh, we will uh, then uh, do that. It's kind of this fine balance of slowly releasing, checking and looking at how it goes. If it goes well, we can continue on and slowly uh, release more and more of those measures. Thank you so much. Uh, so this uh, next question comes from uh, Karen in uh, Maple Ridge, and uh, Karen asks, uh, what, what do you recommend people start doing or stop doing so that if they do come into contact with the virus, their innate immune systems can handle the infection without leading to uh, an emergency? Well, what's most important, I think, is to prevent being exposed to the virus in the first place. So it's all those measures of social distancing or physical distancing, washing hands, cleaning the uh, high touch surfaces often if you're in at work, for example, um, and all these various measures, staying away from people who are sick. So I think that's the most important thing. Of course, staying healthy is very important. And I think, uh, but there's nothing really to, because people t sometimes say, I'm going to boost my immune system. I think if you're healthy, your immune system is working really well. And unless you have specific medical conditions or you're taking specific medication, uh, your immune system is there to work and it, it's there to defend your, uh, your body against the, the infection. And so uh, there's nothing in particular. Otherwise, really, I think what is key is to prevent being exposed in the first place. That's the best way um, to stay healthy. And if I could add to that as well, I think there's, uh, of course, physical and uh, infection prevention control types of things, hand hygiene. I think sometimes people forget about the importance of mental health and uh, things like ensuring that you're taking care of uh, your sleep hygiene at the same time. So getting enough sleep is important for your immune system, as well as I know that this is a very challenging time, as Dr. Lavoie mentioned, and ensuring that you're looking after your mental health. A lot of people are uh, feeling anxious during these times. There's a lot of supports that are available virtually uh, as well, uh, regionally again, provincially. So I would also take advantage of those services. And uh, I know that uh, our uh, we are seeing that alcohol sales have been going up and alcohol does affect your immune system. So it's important to make sure that you're drinking moderately during these times as well. So I would add just those parts to be mindful of as well. 
Really good points, doctors. And uh, we, we all know that uh, the guidelines, uh, physical distancing, washing your hands, those are the guidelines that are helping us flatten our curve. But uh, Mustafa in Port Coquitlam, he wants to know, why, why don't we have a 14 to 21 days of total lockdown like the one uh, they had in Wuhan or Italy um, uh, is having before we reach uh, to what happened in Italy and the US? Very interesting question because I think we, we have to recognize that each jurisdiction, each country or each area has its own outbreak that starts in different ways. And so I think uh, Wuhan was a place where it started. We didn't know what was happening initially and it grew quite large before um, they were able to, to get it under control. And so I think in that situation, then you need to have uh, much stricter measures, much more aggressive to be able to actually bring the numbers down and, and flatten that curve. And I think it was similar in Italy. The situation was particularly difficult there. So this is not what we have seen here in BC. I mean, we have seen the introduction over time of uh, cases, and it started to spread from there. And, and then we started implementing measures incrementally, fairly strict measures. So, I, I mean, maybe we don't call this a lockdown, but if you look outside, I mean, this is not our usual way of living. And so I think it's still very, very strict, and that's why it is challenging. But at the same time, it has made a big difference. So we, we implement the measures that we need to implement, uh, and we didn't need to be going beyond that, and I think it's, it's already quite strict, and we are seeing a change. So our measures are working, so we are adapting to our own situation, and I think each area has its own type of outbreak uh, that develops in certain ways. So I think that's, that's important to remember, and uh, we are going through tough times because many measures have been implemented, and including a number that uh, under public health orders by Dr. Henry. Thanks so much. Uh, so this, uh, this next inquiry comes from uh, Samantha in uh, Port Moody, and it's uh, on a subject matter that uh, I have uh, I've had uh, considerable correspondence in my uh, constituency office uh, via email. Uh, so why was the order made to close all gyms and fitness centers? It was, it was assumed that gyms could not apply with the uh, provincial health order. So if there were complaints about specific gyms, uh, why weren't they just singularly investigated rather than blanket order to close down all gyms? And will there be an opportunity for uh, gyms, uh, fitness centers to demonstrate compliance and reopen in advance of uh, May 31st? So in this situation, what we see is the, the way that gyms are used and the way they're designed is actually typically bringing a lot of people in, in close contact uh, to each other and also exercising. So then you also, your, your breathing is very different. It's more active and you can also expel droplets from your mouth uh, more because you're breathing heavily. And also if you have a trainer or typically you get support from somebody working there, you're in close proximity. And also you touch uh, many, many different things, whether it's the floor, the mats, all the equipment, and it becomes extremely difficult to uh, completely sanitize in between persons using those. And so what happened is in, in BC, we've in, instituted a number of measures incrementally, all the public health orders from uh, Dr. Henry, and including the social or the physical distancing and ensuring that we prevent the spread by hand washing often, breaking that chain of transmission, uh, et cetera. And so interestingly, what happened, even though the, the, there was no provincial health uh, uh, public health order provincially to close the gyms, many actually chose themselves to close because they were not operationally, they were not able to adhere to all of these or they were, um, they were assessing their situation as posing a risk to, the, to their clients. And so obviously uh, what we realized is not everyone actually closed, uh, so not all the gyms have actually closed and we've identified actually spread uh, in interior health, spread via a gym uh, of COVID-19 and we had a cluster related to that. And so we knew that there was a potential and it got confirmed. So you put all that together and uh, so that's why we decided to use an order to close all the gyms instead of le just leaving a few open because we know there's a risk and I know it's difficult and this is not a decision we made lightly. We had to assess the, the, the risk really to uh, spread COVID-19 in the community. And, and we did that and, and that's why we chose to issue an order to close the gyms altogether. Thank you so much, doctor. And um, uh, I, we have a question from Dale in Surrey, and uh, which I think uh, this is a question on many minds. Um, is it safe to co-parent 
and have the child go back and forth between families during this crisis. And also another parent asks, what is the advice for parents who share custody during this time? Yeah, that's, I, I find this to be a very uh, interesting question, but also a touching question. I think families are very important and be close, being close to your loved ones is extremely important, especially during tough times like this. So I would certainly not recommend to uh, not have uh, shared custody or, or uh, having the kid go between the two households. But that being said, of course, uh, what we want to do still is to limit the spread of COVID-19. And it's, then it's really, really important to make sure that the two households are uh, reducing the risk of introducing COVID-19 uh, in their house. And so all those measures that we've been talking about, physical distancing, hand washing, staying away from people who are sick, et cetera, et cetera, all those good measures, they're extremely important. And so uh, people can certainly uh, take care of their loved ones and their kids like that. I think I'm, I'm very supportive of that. Of course, it's extremely important. Uh, as long as we understand that we we still need to adhere very strictly to all those measures to to protect the whole family on, on both sides. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So we have a question from Tom, and Tom's in New Westminster, and this this is kind of an interesting one. Never really thought about. And what Tom says is, uh, what would be the health ramifications? Uh, if one were to contract both COVID-19 and the flu, uh, were that to happen, would it be possible for the two viruses to pass genetic info to one another? Huh, that's a very interesting question. So I don't think at this time we've identified people who were co-infected, but we know that in the past, before COVID-19, we are. It, it is possible to see co-infections between different types of viruses, so influenza and others. And we've seen that, not, not very often, but we do see it once in a while. So what we can deduct or, or guess in this situation is if that were to happen between COVID-19 and influenza, which are two fairly significant viruses, influenza is also potentially very uh, severe and could affect people very uh, severely. Uh, we could assume that the double infection could be bringing more severity and more risk of complications. But, I mean, we'd need to see it. Uh, it I don't think it's impossible biologically, and that's what we would assume uh, we would be seeing. Thank you so much. Uh, we just talked about the flu, doctor, and uh, also uh, Brent, who, who is in Langley, he suffers from allergies each year, each year and he wants to know, um, and this is what I think a lot of other people want to know. My mother is one of them. Um, uh, how do you know the difference uh, in symptoms between, uh, between flu and that of COVID-19? Oh, that's interesting because uh, the symptoms, of course, of any uh, respiratory infection uh, are quite similar because the body reacts in certain ways when we're infected in our uh, respiratory tract. And so we, those two conditions in particular share many of the symptoms. So sometimes we can't say which one it is just clinically, just hearing about that the fever, for example, and the headache and, and, uh, and the chills. And so that could be one or the other. Right now, currently what's happening is we know that influenza is on its way down. So the numbers have been going down as, as it does every year because it's seasonal. And so during the spring, usually the numbers go down and we have very few, if any at all, during the summer uh, influenza cases. And so what now we're seeing currently is uh, any respiratory symptom is, is more and more likely to be COVID-19. Thank you. So this is a this is a interesting one. Uh, Dr. Henry uh, constantly reminds us about the importance of uh, hand washing, uh, but uh, Tammy in uh, Port Moody, uh, she says, well, what's the recommended protocol for uh, face washing? Ah, okay. So I'll explain why hand washing is so important. So we we say regularly that we need to break the chain of transmission. So to prevent an infection from one person to another. Um, we need to put measures in place to limit. Uh, so what's happening is to limit the droplets from one person. So when you cough and you sneeze, this is the main way that the virus is actually going um, to infect somebody else. And so um, we're trying to prevent those droplets from your nose, your, your throat, uh, and your mouth to actually uh, infect somebody else. And so that can happen in different ways. So if you're in front of somebody else too close, 
then you cough and sneeze, you can actually infect the person directly like that. And so that's why the physical distancing is so important. If the droplets don't go very far, so they will move for a few feet in front of you. And the distance is then preventing the droplets from reaching the other person. That's why this is so important. But the other way is also that either when you cough and sneeze, you can contaminate surfaces, or you touch your face, you touch your nose, and if you're infected, you contaminate your hands. And then you touch other people, or you touch surfaces or objects, and then other people can pick it up like that. So that's why we say wash your hands often, because if you are indeed either yourself contaminating your hands, or you picked it up somewhere by washing your hands properly, you will actually remove the virus from your hands and then break that chain of transmission. So I explained both physical distancing and the washing, the hand washing, but that's how it works. So hand washing breaks the chain of transmission. Now face washing. Um, typically, we don't see that transmission uh, with our faces. We don't touch objects. But um, technically, if you're going to wash your face, you have to wash your hands first. Because if you are contaminated, if you touch something or someone with the virus, and then you wash your face, you can actually infect yourself. So wash your hands really well before you do that, as we've recommended before. And that's the reason why uh, one be goes before the other. So I hope this helps. Yes, it does. And uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, people would also like to know uh, how the pu public can access personal protective equipment. Ariel from Burnaby uh, wants to know, are there any plans for the province to develop a distribution system, uh, which, uh, uh, which can take some time, where every adult gets a rationed amount of masks, uh, gloves, and hand sanitizer per month or couple of weeks, and uh, some countries like Taiwan are also doing this and uh, tracking the distribution uh, based on the, the adult's personal health number. Hmm. I'll start on this question. It's an interesting question as well. And uh, I think one of the key areas that we've been paying a lot of attention to is uh, personal protective equipment. And uh, our profession, provincial partners and um, national partners have been doing incredible amount of work to ensure that we have adequate supply levels for all of the personal protective equipments that are needed and necessary. And as you know, what even though uh, the national um, public health officer and Dr. Henry provincially have said that you can wear uh, masks in public, if, even if you don't have symptoms, but it's more of a permissive thing and not to wear medical grade masks because we need to uh, ensure that we conserve those masks for medical use. And so from our context, I think Dr. Lavoie rightly said before, we look at our own experience and context in terms of what kind of measures that we need to implement. And those measures have take, been implemented and have been working as you, we see the flattening of the curve. And we have done a really great job of ensuring that there's adequate level of supplies for our medical staff and our staff that work in healthcare settings and other vulnerable settings. But right now there aren't any plans to have those distributed to the public, uh, and it's also not recommended right now to wear medical grade uh, masks. And I think uh, Dr. Lavoie often says uh, uh, wearing a mask for the public with uh, that's uh, handmade or homemade is like uh, coughing into your sleeve. It's more that you're protecting others uh, from uh, your coughing, not uh, that you're being protected from others. So I think that's an important consideration. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll add to that because I think people sometimes misunderstand the use of a, of a mask, the use of gloves. And I think uh, we have the opportunity here to clarify a few things. So the mask use in public is actually more for people who are infected, are symptomatic, coughing and sneezing, and to prevent them, the wearer of the mask, to actually expel those droplets and contaminate surfaces or actually uh, infect somebody else that's close to you. And so the, the protection afforded by a mask that you wear in public is actually, uh, there's no significant evidence to suggest that this makes any difference. Of course, we have all those other measures, staying away from people uh, six feet, um, staying away from people who are sick, washing your hands, all these things work well. And the mask, addition of a mask in public is not adding any significant benefit. And actually it could cause issues because when you wear a mask, we're not used to doing this, and it, it could be itchy and you touch your face more often, 
Well, if you touch your face without washing your hands, you can actually contaminate yourself and then get infected. And so the, the evidence for a mask is actually not very strong at all. Um, and so, so that's for the mask. The gloves, I think that's a very interesting one. I don't understand necessarily how people think wearing gloves can make a difference because they, it's not, first of all, transmitted through the skin. And your gloves will pick up the virus the same way if you touch surfaces or if you shake somebody's hand or if you touch your face. It's, it's going to be the same thing as your hand without the glove. What is really important is washing your hands. But you can't, it's difficult to wash your hands when, you wear, when you're wearing gloves. And so I think we have to be very mindful that there is a place for gloves in the healthcare setting, but it's certainly not the use that we're proposing in public. And so I just wanted to you know, clarify that because I think we get those questions quite often and uh, I think it's misunderstood. Thank, thank you so much for that. Uh, I can tell you personally, I'm learning an, an awful lot uh, on this session. Uh, so I have a question from Luella uh, who is in Surrey and uh, she just simply asks, uh, why don't all care aides and uh, all housekeepers have access to uh, proper personal protective equipment? Uh, I'll take that one. Uh, health and safety and wellness of our staff are of critical importance for us and uh, certainly one of the things that I, as I mentioned that we've been working really hard with our partners is to ensure that we have an adequate supply. So uh, there are um, personal protective equipment like masks that are recommended uh, for care aids uh, and those are uh, provided. So if there are any concerns, uh, happy to connect on that. But uh, there is a very uh, uh, robust way that we have outlined what the guidelines are based on best evidence. And uh, those equipments are uh, given out to our, all of our staff on a daily basis uh, as well. And then we have been keeping a very close eye on our supplies at the same time. Thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, we have been hearing from the Premier, Minister Dix, and Dr. Bonnie Henry. Uh, they have all shared the decision uh, to cancel elective and non-urgent surgeries. And uh, they have all uh, been, uh, they, have, they have felt like how difficult this was. Uh, and uh, they had to make this uh, decision to prepare our hospital during this pandemic. This has had a profound impact on those who have been waiting for surgeries. And uh, uh, Tania from Mission Maple Ridge, she would like to know, uh, she's curious why so many surgeries have been postponed. Uh, my mom's aneurysm repair was canceled less than 24 hours prior to surgery. Why so many hospitals be on hold waiting for the big outbreak when currently these surgeries could be moving, moving forward? And what is the backlog of all these cancellations going to look like? Yeah, great question as well, and an important one. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I talk about the dedication and sacrifice of our medical staff, staff and leaders in the health system, but there's also been a lot of uh, dedicated and committed actions by the community and sacrifice that the community members have made. And one of the key areas has been in elective surgeries. As you know, that was a very important decision that was made early in our uh, COVID-19 response to ensure that we have an adequate level of uh, capacity, not only in our hospital, but uh, hospitals, but across all of our critical care and um, intensive care types of capacity, because what we sometimes have to do is train up some and uh, upscale some of the folks that if the worst case scenario does occur in our setting, we're prepared for that. So that was the decision that was made looking at some of the other examples across the globe and where the uh, biggest uh, morbidity and mortality took place was when the health system was not prepared to deal with COVID-19. So we did a very good job in BC of ensuring that uh, we proactively took that step to prepare and developed in Fraser Health very comprehensive and phased approach to ensure that we have adequate level of critical care capacity as well as hospital capacity and big part of that was postponing uh, elective surgery. So I'm sorry to hear about your mom's surgery and the aneurysm. Most of the aneurysms are considered urgent emergent cases, so they do proceed, but a few of them that are elective have been postponed. And I look forward to uh, the time that we can look at recovery and uh, catching up with the uh, elective surgeries. And there's been active conversation provincially and regionally for us to develop a solid plan for us to do that very quickly. Uh, so thank you for that question. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Lavoie. And uh, at this point in the, uh, the program, we're going to uh, shift to live questions. And anybody that's uh, watching this on uh, Facebook uh, or on YouTube, uh, if you uh, want to uh, submit a question, uh, now is the time to do so. We've, uh, we've still got a fair bit of time left in the, in the show here. Uh, so the first question, uh, the live one, is uh, from Neelam. And Neelam asks, uh, for seniors in residential care and assisted living, social isolation can be an impact on their mental health. So what steps are being taken to allow family to visit and interact in a safe manner to support their social and emotional well-being? In other words, when can we visit our loved ones again? Yes, that's a very, uh, very good question because it is difficult. And I think we, we are trying to balance two different things here. So I think we know that the risk to people living in long-term care facilities and assisted living facilities are also at the highest risk of um, the severity of COVID-19 and complications. And so, so that being said, we also realize that the measures that we've put in place are also challenging and difficult. So we are restricting visitors quite significantly for a good reason, but at the same time, that's what also it, it creates a bit of isolation. And so, um, so that's, we recognize that. And so, of course, we have people working there in, in those facilities. And on top of that, what we have done, we're trying to also, um, we have teams available to help. And so when we identify issues, if, for example, they're, um, they're being more affected uh, from the isolation, trying to see if there are services that might be required to help there. Um, and so, but it is, I, I do recognize it is very challenging. And so to protect the health on the one side, you also create some, um, some challenges on the other. And so we're, we're trying to see also, uh, hopefully at some point we're gonna start loosening up on, on the measures and there might be some opening there, but we're not there yet. And so very difficult situation. And um, we, we do regret that it, it is causing some harm at the same time that we're protecting their health. Um, and, and we're, but technically people are present and can actually interact with, with the residents. And if they identify any issues, um, we certainly are there to help um, alleviate those problems. And I'll add to uh, Dr. Lavoie's response, and I agree, it's been uh, certainly very, very challenging times. And I am very proud of uh, how Fraser Health has responded to uh, ensuring that we're protecting our vulnerable populations in long-term care assisted living. And there's been a huge amount of strategies, including uh, SWAT teams that go in to support uh, staff as well as uh, residents in these facilities. Now, with this challenge, as you mentioned, around social isolation, uh, there has been creative solutions as well. And I think, you know, while we are physically um, distant, we can be socially connected and there's been a lot of creative uh, virtual mechanisms that we've mobilized to ensure that uh, residents can still connect with their loved ones. And I know that this can be still challenging and not the same as giving your uh, mom or dad a hug. Uh, but right now we are having to do with those virtual hugs and uh, uh, connecting virtually wherever possible. So again, asking for your patience as we do manage through this COVID-19 response. Thank you so much. And our next live question is from uh, Barbara. And uh, she would like to know, what is the protocol for maternity delivery in BC? Can the father be present? Uh, or, and uh, do they have to self-isolate afterwards? Also, uh, what about grandparents? Uh, um, what about grandparents? Can they be present during the delivery? Right now, uh, Fraser Health actually has the youngest population, so we have the most number of uh, births in the whole province. So we see about 3,000 births in a year. So that's a lot of new lives that are coming. And I know that, again, families would love to join that special time. Uh, but right now, it's restricted to just having one person be present. Uh, unless the mom has COVID-19, you don't have respiratory or droplet precautions that need to take place. But it is one visitor. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so I uh, have another question. Uh, this is uh, from Daniel. And uh, Daniel is confused about masks. And here's what she says. She says, Dr. Tam has said healthy people shouldn't bother with masks. 
But then she changed her mind and said healthy people should wear masks. And uh, she believes that it was the CDC that recently said healthy people should wear masks in public. But she's also heard that cloth ones are dangerous as they keep particles that could be contaminated close to their mouths. So she wants to wear a mask in public, but she doesn't really know what kind uh, or uh, recommended uh, ones are, are safe. Okay, so that's the question about mask, and it is a, a little bit confusing. And I, it, it looks like there was a change in direction, but actually it was more... Um, so uh, let me take a step back. So what is the use or, of a mask uh, in public? What is this for? And, and how would it work? And so I explained earlier, it's actually mostly about the person wearing the mask trying to prevent their droplets from going somewhere else, to, to infect somebody else if you're sick or to contaminate surfaces. And so to protect the wearer, the mask would also need them to have uh, an addition to it, to it the person should be wearing either goggles or a face shield because in public, if you're too close, as I said earlier, this, this rule of six feet or two meters, if you're too close and somebody is sick close to you and, and coughs or sneezes, the droplets will be projected onto you on your face and you need to protect your eyes and, and your, your nose and your throat uh, from being uh, infected by the virus. So the mask um, is technically not all that useful if you are maintaining your distances, if you are staying away from sick people. And, and also just the mask without the goggles or without a face mask is, is actually only a partial solution and you can still get infected through your eyes. And so, the, the, like I said earlier, there is the evidence to say we should be wearing a mask in public is very, very small. There might be a benefit, and of course, I think the benefit is more, some people are very mildly symptomatic. And so they walk around, and they might not be coughing, but they talk loudly, and they go too close to people. So that would actually contain the droplets inside the mask and prevent the transmission. So it's not so much to protect you, it's to prevent the person wearing the mask from transmitting. And so the, the mask then, if we were to choose one, is certainly not an N95 mask or those that we see with big filters that is very tight on your face. You don't need that. What you need is something to uh, prevent the droplets from leaving your mouth and your nose and getting caught in the mask. And so uh, just a even a piece of cloth that's dense enough or two layers of cotton would actually do the trick and you can figure out a way uh, to have straps or something to hold it and that would actually be okay. We talk about you know, surgical mask or, or procedural mask, that would be fine, but we want to reserve them for the healthcare workers who actually need them critically uh, in their um, performance of their duties. And so uh, the choice really, and, and there's information online about masks, uh, what would work. And so, as I said, we could use uh, ten, um, fabric that is tight enough that it would retain the droplets. So I hope this helps. It's, it's a bit complicated with masks, but it's certainly not something that we highly recommend. It's something that you can choose to do. And I think in some places, in some countries, it's actually cultural, the polite thing to do to wear a mask in public. And so we don't have that culture here uh, for most people in Canada. And uh, so it, it was trying to balance probably all these things and came up with a, a permissive recommendation that says, yeah, if you feel like you want to wear a mask, it might have some benefit. But at the same time, I think it's more important that the other measures are actually adhered to. So the physical distancing, wash your hands, don't touch your face, these kinds of things. Thank you, Dr. Lagua. That was very important information. And Leanne would like to know, how does recovery vary for a patient uh, who has COVID-19? Can uh, recovery last six weeks or longer? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I missed the part of it. Uh, uh, Leanne would like to know, how does recovery, uh, how, how does the recovery vary for a patient who's uh, suffering from COVID-19? And can the recovery last six weeks or longer? Uh, okay, I get it. So most people, so we have to describe COVID-19 in general, so how it affects people. And so we know that we have a number of people who will be uh, showing no symptoms or very, very mild symptoms. And actually the majority will have a very mild disease, 80% or so of, uh, of all the infected persons will actually have very mild disease. And so usually the symptoms will last for a few days. So you get infected and then you, like let's say somebody uh, infects you and it takes a few days, five to six days until you actually, so you incubate and you develop the disease. 
After that, once you have your onset of infection, so it becomes apparent you have an infection, for most people, it will last just a few days. It could be three, four, five days, and typically, it'll go away. And, and so that's the vast majority. Now, if you have people who will have a more severe uh, disease or infection, uh, and that is more uh, particularly the case in people who are older or much older, and also people with certain chronic medical conditions. So people who are immunosuppressed, have, have diabetes, have uh, lung conditions, respiratory conditions in the first place. So these kinds of conditions could lead to a more severe disease. And that actually could mean the person will be sick for longer. So the typical is a few days. It can be actually a number of weeks. And some people end up in hospital, as we know, and, and they could be there for a number of days to a few weeks, especially when it gets really severe. And so the more severe the disease, the longer it can last. Eventually, uh, people will, uh, most people will recover, of course, even when it's a more severe condition. But it, can last, it could last a few weeks, probably. Hey, thank you uh, for that. I uh, have a uh, question from uh, Wu Salk. I hope I uh, pronounced that properly. Uh, if we only test people with explicit symptoms, how can we prevent asymptomatic patients from spreading the virus to the public? Now, based on the many research and clinical data, the proportion of asymptomatic uh, is, is very high. That is a technical question, but I think that's a very important question. And actually, I'm glad that somebody asked the question. We can talk about the transmission of, of COVID-19 in different situations, whether you're asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic or very symptomatic. And so we have to understand two things. So one is when you're, uh, you're mildly or, or asymptomatic, but you are infected, and we know it's possible because we've tested a lot of people, and sometimes some people have shown virtually no symptoms at all, and they did test positive. And so two things can happen here. One is the, vi the, the quantity of virus that you have in your, in your nose, in your throat, is probably lower when you're asymptomatic. So that's the first thing. The second thing is also that if you're not symptomatic, you're not expelling those droplets forcefully, like you're not coughing and you're not sneezing. And that's the main way that COVID-19, like many other respiratory viruses, that's the main way that it transmits. You have symptoms that actually uh, pushes those droplets out to end up on surfaces or infect others. And so for it, even if asymptomatic people can be shown to have the virus up somewhere in their nose or their, their throat, they're not coughing, they're not sneezing. And so the, when you look at what we know so far of COVID-19, there is actually, it, we know it does not contribute significantly to the transmission of disease, which is good news because the, it, does, it means that it's not spreading wildly um, without us knowing. Most, the vast, vast majority of the transmission is occurring when people have symptoms and are then expelling those droplets and or contaminating their hands and touching surfaces. Uh, and, and, and sneezing. And so that's the main way that it transmits, and, and we've seen that since the beginning of this pandemic. And so, uh, of course, it's not impossible, uh, and we would see that probably with people, between people who are in very, very close contact, for example, household contacts, people who hug or kiss or, these, or exchange, uh, you know, uh, food or utensils and things like that. So you would have to have a very, very close contact to infect from an asymptomatic, somebody without any symptoms, to somebody else. So that's very reassuring. The persons that show no symptoms, even though they might be infected, which can happen, is certainly not a significant way to transmit COVID-19. Thank you so much. And uh, Ev would like to know, where is the testing being done in the Fraser Health region? So if you go, oh, go ahead. Dr. So there are 11 sites across Fraser Health region, and uh, uh, they're in Burnaby, Delta, Surrey, Abbotsford, Mission. Uh, I believe there's one in uh, Langley as well, and Surrey. So uh, there's a lot of uh, different uh, sites across the board, and you can go to our website to look, at, look for testing sites, and that'll lead you to the testing center finder, uh, which will locate the closest site for you. Again, there's uh, uh, 11 sites with uh, capacity and uh, uh, not everybody does require testing, but uh, anyone with symptoms can be tested. Thank you. Thank you. 
So this looks like the uh, probably the last question, uh, given where we're uh, we're at in our uh, itinerary here, and it comes from Anna Perma. If a person recovers from COVID nineteen, do they have immunity? If not, how will we achieve herd immunity? That's an excellent question. So we assume that after you get infected you have an immunity that will last for a certain amount of time. We don't know how long this is, and it could be months. It's probably more than weeks. It's probably months. It could be longer, and we don't know just yet. It's a new virus. Um, that being said, we know that um, other coronaviruses are circulating, like the common cold, and we also had SARS and MERS-CoV, and so they all behave somewhat differently, but they do leave a trace in our immune system that will last for a while. And so what we're looking at and, uh, is that we want to combine the natural disease. So the spread of COVID-19 right now is creating some immunity in our population. And we, have, we don't know exactly how much just now, but it's growing. We have more and more people. So a larger and larger proportion of uh, people in BC are uh, getting immune to the disease. And, but ideally what we want is to create that immunity with a vaccine. And so that's why we're also trying to slow down and flatten the curve is to buy time so that we get to that point where we can build immunity with a vaccine instead. And so instead of getting sick to get your immunity, you get a vaccine to get your immunity. And then at that time, then we'll reach the level that's required to stop the transmission, what we call herd immunity or, um, or the immunity of a community. So there's enough people who are immune to it that it cannot transmit easily from one person to the next. There's a barrier because people are immune and they don't, they don't get infected. So we want to achieve herd immunity or community immunity, if you will, um, and ideally with a vaccine, but that can take some time and, and uh, in addition to the disease spreading. And I'll share that uh, one of the things that we talk about is what does success look like in terms of COVID-19 response and what we have done so far and what do we want to see longer term. And Dr. Lavoie has been a passionate advocate for looking at herd immunity as a long-term strategy. And as he mentioned, there's through, uh, through infection and transmission. And uh, that's why we're trying to flatten the curve so it's as slow as possible on that end. But we do so through uh, the safest means possible possible through vaccines. So I want to acknowledge his leadership and passion for that herd immunity and protecting our community longer term. Thank you to both of you for that. Uh, so we're just, we're just about uh, coming to the uh, conclusion here. Uh, I've got my own question here. I'll uh, slip in at the, the very end. In, uh, in recent days, we've seen uh, in the media and uh, on YouTube and such, some, some pretty heavy handed enforcement of uh, people in a park by themselves uh, being uh, warned by the police. We saw a father get fined for rollerblading with his kids. Uh, there's a warning in Ottawa, you can't talk to your neighbor across the fence. Uh, are, you, are you concerned that uh, what might be described as some overzealous or heavy handed enforcement might make it difficult for uh, this buy-in voluntary compliance? that has been so extraordinary in British Columbia thus far? So uh, maybe I'll start. Um, so I think this is an interesting question because it, it speaks to a number of things. I think it speaks to the fact that as a, as a community, as a society, uh, we want to trust each other that we're going to do the right thing. And I think we've messaged many, many times why, not just what to do, but also why we're doing this so that people would comply voluntarily. Of course, those measures are difficult and we can just look outside and see the impact it has on us and our society. And it is difficult to maintain all these measures at all time. And so some people will breach those, um, those, those measures, unfortunately. Now, some of them are probably more risky than others and we do have ways to enforce that, but it belongs, I think, to all of us to do the right thing. And sometimes some people will not. And I think it's the minority. If you look outside and it's, it's obvious that at rush hour, for example, there's nobody on the road. So um, there's a big difference in how we deal with, uh, uh, with COVID-19 and how we live our lives. So you, t you walk on the sidewalk and people will walk away from you when you cross them. And so I think most, the vast majority of people are following those, uh, those guidelines and those recommendations and are adhering to, um, to the orders. It, it is unfortunate that some people actually are disregarding that and they are putting themselves but also other people at risk. 
So in terms of um, enforcement, I think it, it also belongs to all of us to share the message. It's not just about the RCMP or the bylaw officers or us coming in and, and inspecting and, and uh, ha pr bringing in the enforcement. I think it belongs to all of us to share the message. It's like, hey, I see that you're doing this, and that's actually uh, pretty risky in terms of risk of transmission. You should consider not doing that. And I mean, not everybody will respond positively, but and I, I think it's, it's unfortunate that sometimes some people are uh, going to the extreme and trying to um, stop people from doing things that maybe are not at risk. Because if you're with your own, your own household members uh, and you're in a park, I mean, you're already in co close contact at home, so that is okay. But you don't know that if you just look at people sometimes. And so I think we have to be also understanding, and, uh, but, uh, but also make sure that we do our best to follow all those recommendations. So it's a bit complicated, and I, I, I hope I helped uh, um, that conversation and answer the question. But um, thank you for your question. It's, uh, yeah, it's an important I, one. Yeah, I think, I mean, I agree with Dr. Lavoie because we, we have been able to flatten the curve by working on this together as a society, as a community. It's, it would not have happened if people were not compliant with all of the measures that Dr. Lavoie had talked about earlier. Uh, and that's been on a daily basis communicated provincially with Minister Dix and Dr. Henry. I also think that uh, Canadians in general are more compliant. And uh, I sometimes give the example of looking at the HOV lane uh, prior to COVID-19. And you know, even if when, when we have worse traffic, uh, on Highway 1, high, uh, HOV lane is usually actually, rules are quite adhered to regardless. So when it comes to COVID-19, I think we're seeing that impact because we have been looking after each other and doing what we what's necessary. And I think it's important that we continue to do that. For people that are interested, um, there's Google Analytics that's looking at the impacts that uh, uh, those these social um, distancing measures or population health interventions have had. And you can download what it looks like in BC and you can see that uh, together we've made a big difference in uh, reducing uh, all of the areas that where we've used to have mass events, where we used to have uh, restaurants and open and all of those things have come down significantly. So again, I'd like to acknowledge all of you and our communities for doing your part and thank you for that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee and uh, Dr. Lavua. Uh, thank you for all this great information. Uh, I know uh, COVID-19 has impacted all of, all of our lives and uh, I hear from so many of my constituents and I know John can also agree with me and uh, uh, people are uh, impacted, all their lives are impacted, not just the health, but also they're losing jobs. Uh, so there's a lot of anxiety. So I'm really thankful to you uh, for taking out the time and answering their questions. And uh, also I would like to uh, thank all of uh, you who joined us uh, and be part of this virtual town hall. Uh, also big thank you to my co-host, uh, John Martin, uh, for uh, uh, helping me uh, uh, during this time and uh, helping take the, all the questions. Also would like to thank uh, our health minister, Adrian Dix, and also provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, for what they are doing. Uh, uh, wherever I'm going, I'm hearing really amazing things about them. They have been trying to give up-to-date information in a very calm, uh, in a, so that people uh, can get their answer, uh, questions answered, but also their anxiety level can go down as well. So uh, thank you uh, for all their hard work and uh, for, for supporting the British Columbians. And before we wrap up, uh, we want to leave you with a few additional resources and uh, I'll ask uh, uh, my co-host to start with those. Thank you so much. So for provincial support and COVID-19 information, uh, you can go to uh, www.govgov.bc.ca slash COVID-19 and seniors looking for additional support at this time, uh, please call 211 or visit www.bc211.ca. Also, if you or a family member need additional uh, medical advice, uh, you can call 811 uh, for the latest medical updates, including case counts, uh, prevention, uh, risk and test testing, uh, please visit www.bccdc.ca. Uh, and for the provincial health officers' orders, notices, and guidance, visit www.gov.bc.ca slash pho guidance. And for non-health related information, including financial 
childcare, education supports, travel, transportation, essential uh, service information, visit www.gov.bc.ca slash COVID-19 or call 188-COVID-19, that's 188-268-4319 between 7.30 and 8 p.m. seven days a week. And uh, also remember, please follow the public health uh, guidelines so that we can all help protect our families, our friends, our neighbors, ourselves, and those we haven't met yet. And uh, these are very um, basic measures, as uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Lavua has have mentioned, and we should continue our efforts and uh, to stop the spread and flatten the curve. Okay, gang, we're in this together. Stay at home if you're sick. Wash your hands frequently and for 20 seconds. Cover your cough, sneeze with your elbow, and don't forget, even though we're staying apart, we still need to stay connected. We have three more virtual town halls this week for those living in other parts of the province, and you can uh, find out more information of those at gov.bc.ca slash COVID-19 town halls. Links to these resources uh, are now in the description below. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone.